Right, so I'm going to be starting um, a series. We've got, we have three series um, running sort of at the same time as each other. Um, one of them is continuing from the Beatitudes, which we've just finished looking at. Um, Keith and Fiona are going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount, the rest of the teaching that we find in there. Clive's going to be looking at um, some things from the Old Testament that he'll be explaining about um, when he comes to have his turn. And I'm going to be talking about the gifts of the Spirit, spiritual gifts. So we're making a start on that today. I think as we begin, could Anna, could you just put on the screen the starting verse that we all read together at the start of the meeting? I think there's too much gain on the mic because it's kind of ringing a bit. Just remind ourselves of this, because it, it, what I have to say today kind of boils down to this. All right? So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. <laughs> ask. Ask, seek, and you will find. So we're not passive in what I'm going to be talking about today. We're active. We actively need to ask. We actively need to seek. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Then there's a whole load of examples about giving good gifts. And at the end of it, it says, how much more will God give us the Holy Spirit if we ask him for it? If we who are evil know how to give good gifts to our children, God who is good gives great gifts. And the greatest of these is, well, Jesus. And Jesus himself, as we'll see, gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. But we need to ask. And we need to seek. And then we will find. All right, thank you, Anna. Spiritual gifts. What's this got to do with spiritual gifts? Well, I wanted to start off this series not talking about spiritual gifts because it doesn't start by saying, give me the presents, right? Like kids at Christmas, yeah? We could get so fixated on all these wonderful gifts all wrapped up like, ha, ah, give me, give me, give me, and I hope mine's the biggest one, yeah? We could get so preoccupied with the gifts that we forget about the giver. And actually, we can't get the gifts. We can't use the gifts properly unless we have the giver. So the person behind the gift is really important. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So today I want to speak about the giver of the gifts, who is the Holy Spirit. So there are spiritual gifts, and we will be learning more about these in coming weeks. But without the Holy Spirit, they're useless. They're meaningless. They can even become dangerous. They can be misused. Just an example, the gift of prophecy can be misused. We start seeing clairvoyance and all these other things that start doing weird stuff in the spiritual realm. That's not of God. But these gifts, we've got to get the giver. We've got to get the Holy Spirit in the right place for the gifts to then take on their full meaning and power. So let's begin. It's, it's very difficult narrowing down passages about the Holy Spirit because he is found throughout the whole Bible. We see him at the very beginning in Genesis hovering 
over the waters, acting and creating and bringing things into being as God the Father called them out and into existence. And we see him at the very end in Revelation, calling along with us the church to come and drink from the waters of life. He is alive and active throughout the Bible from beginning to end. And indeed, he is active and alive right now. A whistle-stop tour of a very difficult concept. Brace yourselves. I hope you've buckled your seatbelts up. It's like the Trinity in like 120 seconds. Okay? So Christians believe there is only one God. All right? However, there are three parts or aspects or expressions or functions or indeed persons of the Godhead. We've got God the Father, God the Son, who is Jesus made flesh, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, this concept, don't worry, you're not alone. If this is tricky to wrap your head around, it is, okay? God is three in one, but he is also one in three. And this is called the Trinity. And the Trinity are of equal authority of each other. They have equal power to each other. Indeed, they are the same. Yet, they somehow perform different functions. And the Holy Spirit is a vital part of Christian life and experience. Indeed, without the Holy Spirit alive and at work within us and flowing through us, our church would become dead and dry. Or might morph into some religious institution with just a whole bunch of rules, but there's no life to it. Just like the sponges that Jackie was showing us earlier. Without the water, they're hard and rough and you try and wash yourself with that, you'd, you'd scrape yourself. It'd be very uncomfortable and painful. But with the filling of the Holy Spirit, they're much softer and they can be used for the purpose for which they were made. And indeed, they carry, oh, we could go on to the, go, go off track here. We could, they carry the water, yes? Why to be squeezed out? Yeah, they're conduits. It's not just like, gimme, 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 I, I need all the water and then nothing comes out of it, right? They're there to be carriers, to be transporters so that the spirit can move through them. All right, okay, the water, rather. Okay, let me bring it back. Sorry, I got carried away. We need the Holy Spirit alive and at work in our lives, in our church. And when we seek this, we will find it. And when we do, we find life. And we can live life in the way that God wants us to live it. We've just been looking at the Beatitudes. And we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount, which opens up a whole load of teaching. And it's a call. Jesus is issuing a call to his followers saying, come and live life my way. And you thought that living life, you had to achieve this level of Holiness or spirituality or whatever. But Jesus calls us and he says, in order to live life my way, you don't need to achieve levels of spirituality or holiness or whatever at this level. You need to achieve this. And the whole point is it's impossible. It is impossible. Living life the way God wants us to live it, if we try and do it by ourselves, if we try and do it in our own strength, it's not going to work. If you think Christianity is just a following a bunch of rules, you're going you're gonna to fall short because you're going to break them. We cannot do it. The whole reason we cannot do it is because we need 
the Holy Spirit. You see, God isn't a mean and nasty God. He doesn't say, here's the really high, unachievable level, and now I'm going to stand back and go, ha, 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 watch you fail, ha, ha. No. He says, here's my standard from where we've fallen, through the fall and through sin and everything. Here's my standard. My standard hasn't changed. But I give you a helper. I give you my spirit. I give you strength to enable you to live the way I'm calling you to live. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't do it. We need the Spirit in our lives. Just like some of the songs we were singing earlier, show your power. Show your power. <laughs> we could see in John 14, 26, Jesus tells his disciples, he says, and this is the amplified version, so it kind of expands and gives extra words to help us understand the meaning from the original language that it was written in. It says, but the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me and act on my behalf, he will teach you all things, and he will help you to remember everything that I have told you. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit in his place. This other expression of himself to be with us, to empower us, to help us. I just want to dispel a few misconceptions this morning. Jackie used the illustration of water, which was great. Illustrations to help us understand things. She mentioned fire. It was mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. The Holy Spirit is described as, as fire at Pentecost. Yeah? Other examples? A dove, yeah, descending onto Jesus. Now, let me just let me just say that. The Holy Spirit is not a dove. Okay? The Holy Spirit is not a fire. The Holy Spirit is not water. We're given descriptions like these in the Bible to help us understand. And they say the Spirit descended on Jesus like a dove. That's a very important word. Something like fire settled on the disciples it's 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 picture language trying to describe the spiritual event that they're witnessing but there's no words because it's it's spiritual so something like a fire or a dove or water don't go thinking that the holy spirit is a fire or is a dove, you're walking around in the park and going, oh, there's all these pigeons, and oh, look, a dove, there's the Holy Spirit. No, it's not that. It's picture language. And also, please dispel from your mind the idea that the Holy Spirit is some kind of force or some kind of energy or supernatural power. He certainly has supernatural power that he exercises and he enables us with. But for me, it's not, it's not like in the Star Wars films where, you know, I'm going to use the force and they move whatever it is. That's not the Holy Spirit, all right? It's not a force. And the problem with thinking this way is that if he were just power, or if he were just energy, we can easily start to see this power as being something we can control and manipulate. Where we are in charge, where we are powerful, full of power, where this energy 
has to do our bidding and in so doing makes us feel in charge and in control. Where in fact, it's not our power at all. It's the Holy Spirit's power. We are not powerful. He is. That's why we need him. We just allow him to work with us and through us. It's not us being powerful. So we don't ask God to fill us with his power, give, make me some sort of superhero and the muscles will start bulging out the clothes. No. The Holy Spirit works in us and through us as his power. We just have the humble invitation to come and work alongside and be involved in what God is doing. So, Holy Spirit then, if he's not a dove, if he's not fire, if he's not water, if he's not power, what is he? Holy Spirit is a person. And we need to honor him as such. Now, don't get me wrong, he's not a human being. Not a human being. He is spirit. In the same way that God the Father is not a human being. Jesus is. But God and the Spirit are not. However, the Holy Spirit does have a personality. His desire is to be our closest friend, our comforter, our advocate, our strengthener, our teacher. <coughs> Indeed, Jesus had a very close relationship with the Holy Spirit. He totally depended upon him. He was led by the Spirit, and he only spoke what he heard the Spirit speaking. We see Jesus is conceived in the womb of his mother Mary through the power of the Holy Spirit. He is literally born of the Spirit. Then later, just before he starts his earthly ministry, he is baptized in water. And as he rises from that baptism, he is also baptized with the power of the Holy Spirit. And Matthew 3, 16, 17 recounts this. It says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and resting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. And we also see Jesus instructed the disciples, that they too needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke 24, 49. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. Jesus knew the mission or commission he was about to give his disciples just before he ascended to heaven, where he says to his disciples, I give you all my authority. Now go into the world, make disciples, baptize them, and I'll be with you. How could Jesus be with us if he's now gone up to heaven? Well, he gives us the Holy Spirit. That's why the disciples had to wait. He says, wait there until I give you my power, until the Holy Spirit comes. The person of the Holy Spirit is who you need. And he will empower you to do all the things that I'm asking you to do. And you know, the disciples in Jesus' day needed the Holy Spirit. Guess what? The disciples today need the Holy Spirit. And if you are a disciple, if you follow Jesus, if you call Jesus your Lord and your Savior, you need the Holy Spirit today. I need the Holy Spirit today. 
So we see Jesus, he ascends to heaven. And the disciples wait in Jerusalem. And they're praying together for several days. Ask, seek, knock. Here they are, asking. Here they are, seeking. Here they are, knocking. And then Pentecost happens. Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And we see many other instances It wasn't just that one time at Pentecost. Loads of other places in Acts where people are filled with the Holy Spirit. Again and again, different people. Sometimes the same people at Pentecost, they get filled again. Other people getting filled. Oh, Jesus. Stir us. Lord, we ask, we seek. We knock today. We need you, Spirit. We need you. We can't do this without you. The Holy Spirit was at work in them. And the Holy Spirit is at work in us. Yes, the Holy Spirit worked a miracle. In our lives when we came to Jesus, when we said yes to Jesus, you know that was a miracle? That rebirth of your spirit that was dead inside you, being made alive. The spirit indwells in us at salvation. But like the disciples, there comes a time when we also need a, a filling of the Holy Spirit. And there's other examples in the Bible. We look at the the Samaritans who, who, who accepted Jesus first and then later on the Spirit was poured out onto them in, 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 in his fullness. We, we see lots of examples of this happening. Now you could be filled with the Spirit at salvation. Yeah, it might happen. But equally, it might not. So, as believers, as Christians, we do have the Spirit at work in us. But we need this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And just like water, where we baptize in water, where, where we get completely submerged, just like these sponges getting completely soaked in water, we need to say, Come, Holy Spirit, fill me, saturate me, soak me in your presence. And then it becomes like a river. Billy Graham describes the Holy Spirit like like a river. You're filled with the Spirit, but then it's like a continual filling. You think of the River Thames or or the River Nile or, or the Amazon River. And there's this constant flow. And yes, there's loads of of people and machines and things taking water out of that river. It's giving out. But it's also constantly being filled at its source. And our source is the Holy Spirit. And as we give out, we need to be filled up. So yes, there's a time when... We're filled with the Spirit for the first time. But there's a refreshing, a refilling that comes. Sometimes we start drying up. This riverbed starts getting really dry, really cracked. Oh, goodness me. Life's, Life's becoming really hard. We say, come fill us. Come fill us. Renew that flow, that source, that Holy Spirit moving in you. The Holy Spirit is gentle yet strong. 
He won't force things. Did you notice that verse at the beginning? Ask, seek, knock. Then the Holy Spirit will be given. Then the Holy Spirit will enter. We've got to knock. We need to take that initiative. The Holy Spirit isn't just going to come like, like the police sometimes, the battering ram, and go, wake, wake up, wake up, wake up, boom, bash the door down, and they all enter in, and the sirens blaring and everything else. Uh-uh. If you don't ask, if you don't seek, if you don't knock, Holy Spirit won't force himself. He won't come bursting in. He'll just wait patiently for another day. <laughs> He'll wait patiently outside your door. You've got to let him in. You've got to say yes. Come, Holy Spirit. But we can trust him. Just as we were singing earlier, you are good. God is good. The Holy Spirit is good. Some of us think, oh, I'm not too sure about this Holy Spirit thing. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. and I, you know, I'm a bit scared. He is good. The Father only gives good gifts. How much more does our Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to us? He is good. So we just got to take some time. We're going to pray for the Holy Spirit. There's no point looking at the spiritual gifts if we're not moving, if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. We simply ask and we receive. The Bible instructs us to lay hands on each other. Please ask before you do this. Obviously, put it in an appropriate place. Also, look, we, we're, not, we're not a church where, you know, if you don't fall down, then it hasn't worked. That's no good. And we're not going to try and push people. And that's just no good. Right? Don't push anyone. Gently put your hand on someone. And whatever, whatever the Holy Spirit does, we say, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. So if you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit before, if you've not been baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the person of the Holy Spirit, we're going to pray for you today that the Holy Spirit will come and fill you. But you know what? We're also going to pray for people who have already been filled with the Spirit, but we just need this constant refreshing this constant flow of the Spirit in our lives. We've got to pray for a refreshing of the Holy Spirit on your life as well. I am happy to pray for people, but I don't want us to... There's a danger, isn't there, with things like this. Spiritual gifts, filling of the Spirit and stuff where the person at the front, the person with the microphone or the person on the stage, they are the all-powerful. They are the one in touch with God. They are the one moving with the Spirit. And everybody else has just come to watch the show. How sad. It's not what the church is called for. As leaders of the church, we are called to equip you for the purpose of ministry. Yeah, I'll pray for you, but it's not come to the front because that's where the power is. We all are in this together. We all, we all get to do the stuff. Okay? So we've got to pray on our tables around us. If you know Jesus, you could pray. If you don't know Jesus, you can still pray and get to know him. All right, so we've got to pray with each other. The musicians are just going to come and play some instrumental music quietly just to help us focus on Jesus a bit. And we're going to pray. We're going to lay hands. We're going to 
ask the Holy Spirit to come if that's what that person wants. Remember, there's the choice involved. You've got to ask. And if you're not asking, well, you know, that's okay. Maybe today is not your day, but maybe today is your day. We need the Holy Spirit. We need him.